I, I think on days like this, I must feel a little bit like the apostles who were with Jesus when he was transfigured, who said, it'd be good if we could just build a tabernacle and stay right here. Because you can just sense the, the work of God in this place this morning. Amen. You can sense his spirit is present and moving. And we're going to pray that that continues as we open his word here in a few moments to hear from him as he speaks to us. And I'm going to invite your attention this morning to the third chapter of the Gospel of John. And most of you will be familiar with this chapter at some level, at least at the very least, you'll know the 16th verse. But there's a backstory before that 16th verse was spoken, and that's the story of a man, a man who was looking for something, a man who was seeking and how he was drawn to Jesus. And we want to talk about that this morning. So I'm going to read verses 1 through 10 only this morning. The Bible reads this way. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? There's an old spiritual song that gives warning with these words. It says this, Everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Now there's a lot of people that aspire to make their way to heaven. But let me say this unequivocally. In order to make our way to heaven, we must be born again. In order to make our way to heaven, there is only one way home, and that is through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is through a willful determination, a decision on our part to believe in the accomplished and finished work of Jesus on the cross and to surrender our life, our heart, our soul, and our all to Him. There was a, an actress who was once questioned about her faith, and her response was this, I pray, I read the Bible, it's the most beautiful book ever written. I should go to heaven. Otherwise, it's not nice. I haven't done anything wrong. My conscience is very clear. My soul is as white as those orchids over there. And I should go straight to heaven. Well, that's, that's a wonderful thought if it was just true. But it's just not. But unfortunately, this may well be a popular sentiment among a lot of people who want to go to heaven but are not on the path to get there. Our souls are not as white as orchids. That is an incorrect assessment of the condition of the human heart because God in His Word said, all we have sinned and gone astray, every one of us has turned to our own way, and that our righteousness before God, by our own merit, is as dirty as filthy rags. That's where we stand before God, in our own merit. We have all sinned, and none of us will get to heaven just by reading the Bible or saying a prayer. If we desire that heaven would be our home, we must know that there's only one way to get there. And the only way home is what I want to talk about this morning. We read these verses in John's Gospel, the third chapter. I hope you have your Bibles open. We'll refer back to those. The main point I want to make for us this morning is very simple. It is that God has made a way for humanity to enjoy eternity with Him. Now, here's the thing that we need to understand, and we need to go ahead and concede this. 
that heaven is God's heaven. It's a place that is being prepared for those who trust in Him. But since it is His heaven, He gets to decide what is required for us to be there. We don't get to make that decision. That's not our call. And God has told us unequivocally time and time and time again in, our, in His Word that what He has presented to us in His Son Jesus is what is required for us to be able to enjoy and experience eternity with Him forever. Jesus is the only way to eternity with God in heaven. He said that Himself. In John chapter 14, whenever Jesus was speaking to His disciples and trying to help them understand that He was about to leave this earth, He said to them, I'm going to prepare a place for you. So don't let your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe in Me. And He says, in My Father's house are many mansions. If that wasn't so, I wouldn't have told you. And so I'm going to prepare this place for you so that where, where I am, there you can be also. And I'm going to come back and retrieve you to Myself. And one of His disciples in a moment of confusion, said, Lord, we just don't know the way. <laughs> and and you, can almost, you can almost probably see in Jesus uh, again. <laughs> don't you understand? I've been trying to tell you I'm the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That, that's a pretty direct statement by Jesus that He is the only way to enjoy eternity with God when this life is over. So, here we are. We're looking at this passage of Scripture this morning. And we see this story of a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is about to have a conversation with Jesus. Now, before we get into that conversation, I think we need to look at the resume of Nicodemus because what we're going to find as we look at that is the resume of a very superb religious performer. Notice what it says about him. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And later, Jesus says to him, Are you the teacher of Israel? And you don't know these things. So there's three different points that are found here on his resume. The first one he's identified as a Pharisee. Now, the word Pharisee is actually a Hebrew term that literally means someone who is separated out, someone who's set apart, supposedly unto God's work. And there was this sect, this group of people, this religious leadership uh, group that were, were identified as Pharisees. And they stood aloof and apart from society. They, they were different. In their minds, they were, they were the standard. They were the bar. You couldn't get a bar. You couldn't get a bar any higher than them. They were the ones who actually set the bar for what religious behavior and religious performance ought to look like. And so they stood aloof from everybody else. They basically said, you can never ascend to the level of spirituality that we have. And they were a, a tightly knit brotherhood. They were dedicated to preserving and interpreting and defending Jewish law. And, and their interpretation and their preservation and their defense of it was law. If they said it, that's the way it was. And so they, 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 they were theological hair splitters. And, and they knew intricately the letter of the law. But few of them could probably spell the word love. They knew how to promote and present religious performance and practice. But they didn't know how to care about other people. So Nicodemus was one of these guys. And he was one of those that if you saw him walking down the street, you'd say, oh, that's a Pharisee. We can't touch him. He's, his ways are as far above our ways as the stars are above the earth. He's identified as a ruler of the Jews. Now what happens here is that the group of Pharisees that he was a part of narrows. There was a group of Jews that were known as the Sanhedrin. This group was a group of 70 men and the high priest. And these men exercised jurisdiction of the religious law over every Jew in the world. And they knew they had that authority. They knew they had that power. And they were not remiss to use it. They were the ones that would call people out. They were the ones that would, would, would call sin out and call for the punishment of that sin. They, they would have been the ones that brought the woman taken in adultery to Jesus and said, we should, we're going to stone her. What do you say? That's who they were. So he's also identified as a teacher of Israel. The word 
that is used to describe those, those folks that were teachers in Israel is the word rabbi, and he would have been considered one. So they were those who taught the law to other people. So he was a man of position. He was a man of prestige. He was a man of great power. And he was also someone who seemed to believe that religious performance would make you connected with God. Look at what he says. This man in verse 2 says, He came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, now that, that, was a, that was a good word. He was saying, you're, you're respectable in the fact that you're a teacher. And he says, not only that, we know that you're a teacher come from God. So you see the we, he's including the other Pharisees. In other words, we've had a discussion about this. And, and we see that you're doing some things that, that seem to indicate you're from God. So we know you're a teacher from, come from God. And what was the basis of his identification of the connection that he presumed Jesus had with God? Look at your scripture. He says, we know you've come from God because no one can do the things you do unless God is with him. So he was basing his, presume, his presumption of Jesus having a connection with God on what Jesus did, on his performance, on his activity. He's saying, we look at you and the things you're doing, they're so, they're so noteworthy, they're so astounding, that because you're doing these things, you have to be from God. Didn't, didn't bring up anything about Jesus' heart. Didn't bring up anything about, about the, the deep spirituality that Jesus exemplified again and again and again throughout Scripture. No, it was all based on what Jesus did. So what we see here is the resume of someone who is a superb religious performer. And he believed that performance was the, the, the capital that would put you in a right relationship with God. And he's not alone. Millions, if not billions of people on this planet believe that you can work your way into a right relationship with God. But that's just not possible. All of our works are like filthy rags in the sight of God. How, how good would we have to be to be good enough to work our way into the right relationship with God? Well, we'd have to be as good as God. And we're never going to make it to that point. That's a pinnacle that we can never ascend. And so here we are, we see this man, he comes to Jesus... And the Scripture says this man came to Jesus by night and began to have this conversation with him. Well, we might ask the question then, what, what was it that caused him to come to Jesus? Well, I'm going to tell you that him coming to Jesus was simply this. It was the right response of a restless heart. Now, he was one of this group called the Pharisees. He was one of these called a group out of the Sanhedrin. He was a teacher of Israel. But here he is coming to Jesus by night to have a conversation with him. What, what was the motive in that? Why, why come to Jesus by night? What was there about that? Well, I, I think that there could be a lot of different reasons that he gave himself. Hey, he, he might have said, you know, I, I'm a man of considerable influence and Jesus is moving among the people and he's kind of doing some things. Now, you remember this chapter is written, you know that John chapter 3 is written right after John 2, right? Anybody remember anything that happened in John chapter 2? Well, the first thing, it was the first of the miracles that Jesus performed when he turned the water into wine. But then he, he came to the temple... And he saw some things going on there that he didn't really think should be going on there. And he drove people out of the temple. So, so it, by this point, he's raising a bit of a stir. So Nicodemus might have con con uh, convinced himself, if I go to him and just have a, a, a conversation with him, just, just he, me and him at, late at night, maybe I can persuade him to tone it down a little bit, to kind of get in line with what the, the Pharisaic modus operandi really is. Maybe I can just talk him into to being more like us. Isn't that what the church wants? We want the world to be more like us. And so we put out this standard and we say, if you keep this rule, this rule, this rule, then, hey, that, that's, you're on the right track. But that's not, that's not what it's all about. So he may have thought he could persuade Jesus. He may have come to confront Jesus. He may have come to, to, to throw the hammer at him and to say, look, you know that what you're doing is getting you in a position of very hot water with those who are the religious leaders of Israel, and you better stop it. He may have thought he could come and just strong-arm Jesus 
into not doing the things Jesus was doing the way that he was doing them. So he may have been there to warn him or to threaten him. Or he, he could have just been curious about who Jesus was. He may have come at night because he didn't want anybody else to know. And he just wanted to kind of find out who he was. And so he thought, well, if I just kind of slip off away from everybody and have this one-on-one -on -one with him, I can, I can kind of peel back the layers and figure out who this guy is. Whatever he told himself, I want to tell you unequivocally, that beating within his chest was a restless heart. Scripture says that no man can come to the Father except the Spirit of God draw him. And Jesus, whenever he actually talks to Nicodemus about this whole encounter, he says, look, he said, the Spirit of God blows where it wants to. And whenever it blows, you either respond to it positively or you push it away. He's, he's essentially saying, you're not here just to confront me. You're not here just because you're curious. You're not here just to try to persuade me. What I want to tell you is something that is a greater truth than you would ever allow yourself to believe. The Spirit of God brought you here. It's the Spirit of God that moves in our lives and begins to cause us to be awakened to the reality that there's something missing, there's something vacant, there's a void here, there's a chasm that nothing that we do, nothing that we perform, nothing that we pursue can fill. And we try to fill up our lives with all kinds of things, convincing ourselves that if I can just have this next thing, if I can just experience this next thrill, if I can do this or that, then I'll finally be happy. I'll finally be full. May I tell you that that'll never happen until it's the Holy Spirit of God who fills our hearts. And we have a relationship with God that is brought into our lives by the work of Jesus on the cross. It was God who brought Him there. The meeting itself <laughs> probably kind of took Nicodemus back because whenever he... And whenever he said to Jesus, look, we know who you are. We know that you must be connected with God because of what you do. Jesus said this. He says, what a man does has absolutely nothing to do with him being made right in the sight of God. He says, and immediately, Jesus says, most assuredly, if you have an old King James, it says, verily, verily. <laughs> that means you can write this down. You can chisel it in stone. What can you chisel in stone? That unless someone is born again, he'll never see the kingdom of God. You can work your fingers to the bone, and you can say that it's in the name of God, but unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. So in this meeting, the first thing that happens is that Jesus introduces this concept of the new birth. <laughs> and Nicodemus, being a very practical man, responded to that, and he says, can't happen. <laughs> I've already been born. How can a man, when he's old, enter again into his mother's womb? Can that happen the second time, and can he be born again? It's an impossibility. And so he, he poses before Jesus the impossibility of the new birth. But see, he hadn't had access like you and I do to Luke's gospel, where an angel visited Mary, and she said, how can this be? And the angel said, Mary, with man, <laughs> it's impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. And so if a virgin can conceive a child and bear that child as the Messiah, the saving Lamb of God, to be nailed on a cross for the world, then surely God can create new birth where He's already created birth the first time. But this new birth is different. This, the, and Jesus begins to explain that. He says, Nicodemus, you're all fouled up here. Your mind's a little bit twisted up, and we need to, to sort this out for you. So let me do this. So what He does is He says, what you need to understand is I'm not talking to you about a physical rebirth. What I'm talking to you about is a spiritual experience. What I'm talking to you about is that whenever the Spirit of God begins to move across your life and you begin to sense His work, you begin to sense His probing, you begin to sense Him helping you to understand your condition before God and your need to be right in the sight of God with a righteousness that you can't produce. Whenever you begin to sense that and understand that, and then you respond to that by saying to the Lord, what then must I do to be saved? Then God moves across your life in the power of His Holy Spirit. And whenever the power of the Holy Spirit does His 
amazing work in your life, then you become regenerate. You become born again, not of the flesh, but about the Spirit of God. And so it is, it is something that is a spiritual experience that is supernaturally accomplished. He said the wind blows where it wants to. And you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from. And so is everyone who's born of the Spirit. And, and then he, he asked Nicodemus, are you sure you don't understand this? Because you're, you're someone who's supposed to be well-versed in the Scriptures. And then he says, you know, we talk about what we know about and testify what we've seen. Jesus is saying that about himself. I'm telling you what I've seen and what I know. And I've told you earthly things. And you can't believe those. How can you believe heavenly things? So, he's told him that what has to happen in order for Nicodemus to find his way into the presence of God is not to do all this religious performance, not to do all this religious works, but that in order for him to make his way into the presence of God, there's a mandate that must be kept, and that is you must be born again. May I say to you this morning that there is no other way home. In order for us to have any hope of spending eternity in the presence of God, where He can enjoy fellowship with us and we can enjoy fellowship with Him forever, we must be born again by the Spirit of God. And that transcends anything that I'm able to perform. That transcends anything I'm able to produce. I can't generate that within myself, and you can't either. Jesus says, you shouldn't marvel that I say to you that in order for you to be right and understand the kingdom of God, you must be born again. It's impossible to enter the kingdom of God otherwise. So the question before us, I think this morning is really rather simple. Have you been born again? Because if not, you can talk about heaven all you want to, but you ain't going there. And you say, Pastor, that's, that's a very stark pronouncement. Sounds judgmental to me. No, I'm just reading right out of the Word of God. I'm just telling you what God has said. God wants you in His heaven. He, he created us to enjoy fellowship with Him forever. And He, he created another place for that devious, diabolical devil that resisted Him in eternity before time was a thing. The place that He created for Him was hell. Now in Scripture it says that for those who've rejected God out of hand, that hell has enlarged itself. It was created for the devil and his angels. But because people have said no to Jesus who said yes to the cross, hell has expanded to make room for those who resist the gospel of Jesus Christ. To make room for those who say no to Jesus, who died so that they could spend forever in the presence of God. So yeah, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Only those who have placed their faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross and and trusted that God has provided Him as the path, the way, for us to be made right in the sight of God. Well, how does that happen? You say, well, here's what happens. In Jesus Christ, the, the righteous requirement of the law of God, of the nature of God, for punishment for sin was satisfied. It was satisfied in Him. But the only way that that can be satisfied to my account is if I receive that pardon that God is offering. There's a pardon that's waiting For everybody who says yes to Jesus, and that yes that Jesus desires and requires has got to come from your heart. No one can do this for you. You you may have been signed up on a church roster in cradle roll by your parents. And you might say, I've been a member of the church all my life. That may be true. You might be someone who says, you know what? I've read the Bible through 20 times, and I'm reading it through again this year. It may be true. And you may be someone who says, you know, I say a prayer every day. But I want to tell you something. Unless you've been born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. 
You have to be born again. You have to be born again by the Spirit of God. You cannot be saved by doing. You can only be saved by trusting, by believing, by surrendering your heart, your life, your will to the Lord Jesus, making Him king of your own life and yielding your life to Him in faith, saying, I know and believe you died for me. Anything less is not going to be enough. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Those are Jesus' words. And so again, my question is this, have you been born again? Have you really come to the place where you have surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and you've trusted Him as the only measure of forgiveness that you can receive that will make you right before God? Well, if not, and you've not understood that, your perspective has been wrong. And as this encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus shows us, Jesus always corrects confused perspectives. Three things that he does for Nicodemus that he's trying to do for every one of us who are listening today. He tries to help Nicodemus see and us to see that religious performance never produces right standing before God. You can come to church every day of your life. You can, you can be baptized until you, you look like a raisin. <laughs> You can give millions of dollars to the church. Please do. <laughs> but none of those things is going to make you right in the sight of God. That's religious performance. And, and if you're not doing that out of a heart of love for Jesus who, who died for you and brought you to Himself, then it doesn't matter. So religious performance never produces right standing before God. Secondly, it is God who initiates relationships with sinful humanity. God has broken into the sphere of time and space in the person of His Son, Jesus. He took on flesh and came to this planet. He, he condescended to where we were because He knew we could never ascend to where He is. And in that, in that condescension, He comes to us and He says, I've come as far as I can come to initiate a relationship with you to bring you into right standing with God. And I'm inviting you to come. Why would He do that? <laughs> I'm sad we didn't get to the 16th verse, but that'd be a whole other series of sermons. For God so loved the world. He did it because He loves us. He doesn't need any other reason except that He loves us so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will never perish but will have everlasting life. God initiated that opportunity. God extends that invitation. The King of eternity, who reigns and rules from the throne room of infinity, has spoken and said, you can come here, but you have to come through Jesus. The third thing that he's trying to explain to Nicodemus is this. It is wise to respond when the Spirit of God moves. When the Spirit of God begins to breathe across your life, your attention is required. And when He does, here's what you can know. You will respond one way or the other. You will either say, yes, Lord, I'm coming to you, or you'll say, no, I'm rejecting you. If the Spirit of God is speaking you to, to you today, please just say yes. I'm going to ask us to bow our heads, please. In these next few moments, I want you to focus really on only one thing, and that is this. What is God saying to me? And, and listen, if God is causing all of your all of your perspective that religious performance is what's required. If He's causing all of that perspective to crumble before your eyes in order to bring you to Jesus, then just accept that. Don't, don't say, I've got to hold on to this because this is the image I've created for myself. No, if He's speaking to you in your heart of hearts today and you've never truly been born again, please say yes to Jesus. 
just a moment, I'm going to lead us in prayer. You'll hear some music playing. You'll see some folks down at the front of the church. We're here for you. We're here to try to help answer any questions that you might have about your own spiritual condition. We're here to try to encourage you if you need that, if you're going through tough times and you just need someone to pray with you or to try to help lift you up. We're here for that. If God's leading you to unite with this church family, you want to explore that process, we're here to talk to you about that too. Anything that God is saying, anything that God is prompting, we're here for you. Someone ask you to stand while I lead us in prayer. The music will continue. You'll see us down front. You come as the Lord prompts. Father, please, in Jesus' name, move across every empty heart, helping them to understand that there's nothing and no one that can bring fullness and satisfaction to the soul other than a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And Lord, prompt them, please, to come to you. Prompt them, please, to say yes, even now, and to make their way down, to speak to one of these ministers and to, to let them help them and encourage them. Father, have your way in our hearts and our lives. We wait before you. We trust you completely to do what you've brought us here to do and to say what you've brought us here to say. So in Jesus' name, we just simply ask that you would have your way and that we would be able to say your will be done. In Jesus' name, you come as we wait.